Okay, hopefully I'm here. Uh, let's see, start video, okay. Not only me, that's great. So, going to share my iPad. There we go. This was my complex class. Okay, let's see. Uh, yep. I'm just going to continue. Uh, continue with the previous document. So I promised counter function. By the way, so as always, uh, as before, I'll open the chat. Here's the chat. Uh, so if I freeze, please type something in the chat. Hopefully, it will be better today. Uh, if not, we'll need to figure something out. Okay, so I promised a continuous function that's <coughs> not absolutely continuous. So I just want to address equations, so very good question. So why in general a continuous function can be not absolutely continuous? So just a very quick remark. Well, there are actually many reasons for a continuous function to be not absolutely continuous. In particular, uh, absolutely continuous implies bounded total variation and bounded total variation implies uh, like more or less decent, well, I'll write not too much oscillation, not too bad oscillation. So theoretically, if we cook a continuous function that oscillates like crazy, something like uh, x times sine of one over x, so a function like this, uh, is still continuous, but it's not going to be absolutely continuous. It's not even going to be of bounded total variation. Uh, now, epsilon delta wise, uh, so what do we have for absolutely continuous? We have this. So this should imply this. And of course, individually, we know that each term in this second sum so each term here can be made smaller than epsilon if we have a small enough delta. But theoretically, without any other information, uh, the best estimate we can get from here is something like uh, less or equal than uh, the number of intervals times epsilon and so because the number of intervals doesn't depend on epsilon, it does depend on delta. That's not a good estimate. <coughs> so I also promised that this function is increasing, uh, which makes which, which makes well both of these remarks a little bit harder. But we'll also see that it's still possible to over what you were saying. Mm -hmm. On that last line, when you said the summation, why is it n times epsilon and not just epsilon? Uh, so I'm saying that if, if we just assume that uh, f is continuous. So I'm trying to explain why we cannot just immediately, why we cannot prove that continuous implies absolutely continuous. So if we just assume f is continuous, then the best we can get is this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So my point is, you see, it's, it's still not obvious. For example, if you remember what's uniformly continuous function, it's stronger than continuous, but on a closed interval, it's the same. So on a closed interval, continuous and uniformly continuous is the same. It's not a very easy proof, uh, but it's true. So. I'm just trying to explain why continuous and absolutely continuous is still not the same. So for 
an increasing function, it's of course harder. Uh, for increasing functions, of course, harder. Uh, in particular, for an increasing function, these these absolute values disappear, and we get. But again, you see, uh, the best thing we can get for an increasing function something like this, uh, which is not uh, small anymore, because we don't know how these intervals are arranged. So f of a j doesn't necessarily cancel out with f of b j if these intervals are more or less. Uh, apart from each other. So my point is that if you start proving that a continuous function, even an increasing one, should be absolutely continuous, you'll eventually fail. And so here is an example why. Uh, so let's recall what's our counter set. So our we build our counter set like this. Let me split my screen in house and on the left I'll have a picture, at least I'll try, and on the right I'll have formulas. So the next generation will throw away the middle third. Well, that's not exactly middle third, but let's pretend it is. So on the next generation we throw away two middle thirds. And then on the next generation we throw away four middle thirds. So I want to count how many intervals I'm throwing away. So on step one, I threw away one interval. On step two, I threw away two more intervals. So in total, I deleted three intervals. And on step three, I hope it's seven. So let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, yeah, so on this step, it's seven intervals. And if you proceed by induction, you'll see that on step number n, we delete in total 2 to the n minus 1 intervals. So on step 1, we have 2 to the 1 minus 1. On step 2, we have 2 to the 2 minus 1. Step 3, we have 2 to the 3 minus 1. So let's denote, okay, and then we had annotation. So this, the closed parts, the parts that we don't delete, we called CK. Okay, so this was called C1, this was called C2, this was called C3, and so on. So let's denote OK to be 0, 1 minus CK. So OK is exactly what we erased. So that's an open set. That's an open set. Is an open set. That, OK, freezing a little bit. Is an open set. That consists. of 2 to the k minus 1 open open disjoint intervals. So this is OK. Um, all right, so more, moreover, it's an increasing sequence. Moreover, we have this. Right, because C, CK is decreasing, so OK is increasing. And now I'll define a function on a set OK. So let's pretend that OK, so let's pretend that we enumerated these intervals that participate in OK. And here is the, uh, so, so here, here is the problem that I should also index them by k on the top because like uh, I2 for 
I2 for O2, for example, is different from I2 for O3. Okay, so for this level, here is my I2. And for this level, for the next level, uh, this is my I2. So this is why I need to know this by I2 2 and I2 3. Okay, so this K in the upper index is necessary. All right, and now we define phi of x, uh, I'll write a little bit differently, Oops. for x in i, m, k, define phi of x to be equal to m divided by two to the k. And this is terrible. Uh, this is terrible because phi depends first of all on the level and then on the number of my interval at this level. So first thing I need to check is that phi is well defined. So let me explain why on this picture on the left. So I have this interval i to two, this one here. And then I have this interval, which is one, two, three, four, which is i, uh, three, four. Okay, these are the same intervals. And uh, this is the same interval, sorry. I to two and I three, four is the same thing. Uh, however, I potentially have different definitions of phi on these two intervals. Well, let's check. So if we work with i to two, we get that phi of x is equal to two divided by two square, which is one half. Okay, if we work with i three four, we have phi of x is equal to m, m is what's on the bottom, four divided by two to the what's on the top. And this is again one half. So that's really nice. So even though these two intervals, uh, well, even though this one same interval had different, had two different pairs of indices, uh, but the values of phi actually agree. And the fact is that this will this will all will always happen. So phi is well defined. And this is because if you look at the indices very carefully, uh, you'll see that everything is nice. So why is that? That's because uh, if uh Okay, let's see. So if, uh, okay, what, what do I want to write? I want to write that if an interval I uh, participates. I do have a quick question about yep, our definition ahead. of I. Um, mm -hmm. Should it depend on OK? Because depending yes, on what like, Good question. This is what I've just said. It doesn't. Th this exactly like for the x in the f like the levels of OK. OK is every possible like k going to infinity. Yes. Or yes. Yeah. This is what I'm explaining. Uh, the definition of phi doesn't depend on neither on the k. Yeah. Uh, does depend on k. That's depend on k. Uh, this exactly what like if we end our k at three, when we have x that's in an interval that appears at four, phi won't won't put something on. Will will be the same. So he, he, here's the picture. We have x in O two. So he, he, here is x, for example, somewhere here in the in the middle. It's in O2, it's also in O3, it will also be in O4 and so on. And all the definitions will be the same. 
all the phi of x will be the same. So because here so that phi will put the same value on if it's yes. in the interval, but yes. like in like the first deleted thing. We only have the middle third deleted. So right. if I were to take something like the first bit phi, it's not defined at that value. Here. Uh, yeah. Well, here, no, it is. I, I'm not saying that x should be in every OK. I, I'm saying that if x is in OK, then define phi like this. Oh, OK. So if x is in any OK. Yeah, if x is in none of the OKs, which means that x is in C, then I haven't defined anything yet. But as soon as I see a K such that x is in OK, I can write this definition. The one I just boxed. And my point is that if I see a different K, then this definition will be the same. Uh, and this is what I was going to write, that if an interval i participates in OK and OK plus 1, then uh, i will be like this. So it's either the mth interval in K or the 2mth interval in K plus 1. Uh, this I leave as an easy exercise. This is what we see on this picture. So it was the second interval here, and then the fourth interval here, and then it will be the eighth interval in the next level. Okay, and so for x in i, we have 5x is either uh, m divided by 2 to the k or using the second interval, it's 2m divided by 2 to the k plus 1, which is the same. 2 cancels out and we get m divided by 2 to the k. Uh, so it's well defined. So I, I proved something a little bit weaker. I proved that it's well defined on uh, the subsequent levels. But now if we have ok and o, whatever, ok and ol, then we can go step by step and reach l adding one to k every time. Yeah, but uh, what you just asked, so let me write this as a sentence, that we, we have only defined phi on the union of all k's, which is 0, 1, minus c. So on this union, we're fine, because if x is in the union, then x is in one of all k's. And then if x is in all k, then we just find in which interval it is and write this definition. Yep, go ahead. Someone? Um, is there any uh, way of like zooming out a little bit? Because the screen's getting a little cut off for me at the sides. Uh, like this? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, yep. Yeah, absolutely no problem. So just let me know because I'm seeing this uh, huge green rectangle on my monitor and uh, if you're seeing something different, let me know. All right, so now if X is in C, we define phi of zero to be zero and okay uh, i'll write it in a more decent way so now define phi of zero to be zero and for x in c which is not equal to zero define phi of x to be the supremum of phi of t when t is in the union of ok and t is smaller than x. 
So if you look at the picture of the counter set, if x is in the counter set and it's not zero, then there's always some interval on the left from x that we erased. And because there is always something on the left from x that we erased, it means that there exists such a t. And so this supremum is nicely defined. Okay, I, uh huh. Sorry. Yep. All right, so now uh, we need to prove some properties of phi, and I'll state it as a theorem. So phi is increasing continuous and maps zero one onto the same zero one. Uh, moreover, for any x is zero one minus c, we have phi prime of x is zero. So, all right, let's see what's obvious. There's only one obvious thing here. It's this last thing about the derivative. Uh, because if x is not in C, then x is in this union. If x is in this union, it means that x is in one of all k's. Now, all k is an open set. So it means that x is in one of the intervals that participates in all k. And this interval is open. And on this whole interval, phi is a constant. So it means that if x is not in C, then around x, phi is a constant. And this means that phi prime of x is zero. So this part is actually easy. Uh, nothing else is easy. So let's, so let's first prove that phi is increasing. So, uh, okay, so phi is increasing. Uh, okay, let's name this step one. Phi is increasing. So we take x less than y and we'll consider cases. So case number one is that both x and y are in O, are in the union of all k's. So, uh, okay, in O, which is the union of all k's. So this is case one. Uh, so in this case, we can always find, because all k's, all k's are increasing, it means that we can always find, yeah, find a k such that x and y are both in OK. And on OK, phi is obviously increasing. So let's go a little bit back to the definition. So see if we enumerate, well, if we enumerate these intervals and we enumerate them like in the order. So if one interval is on the right from another, uh, then its number is bigger and so phi is bigger because here we have the m. So it means that x is in i, k, m. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> See the good thing is I'm sitting in my elbow so I won't pass my verses to you. Uh, so y is in i k n, and uh, x is less than y implies that m is less or equal than n. So because we enumerate this interval in the in in the right order, uh, we cannot have that a smaller number is in the right hand side interval. And because m is less or equal to n, it implies that phi of x, which is equal to m divided by 2 to the k, is less or equal than n divided by 2 to the k, 
which is 5y. So 5x is lesser or equal than 5y. So that's end of case one. It's very important here that these all case are increasing. So the most important sentence here is this one that we can always find a k such that x and y both belong to all k. Okay, so case two is when, uh, let's see, x is an O and y is not an O. So y is in C. Uh, then what? Then we know that phi of y is equal to the supremum of phi of t such that t is less than y. And uh, let's see, and t is an O. But x works. So x is an O, and we also assume somewhere that x is less than y. So x is an O, x is less than y. So x works perfectly well as a candidate for t. And because phi of y is the supremum, it's bigger or equal than phi for our candidate. So again, we get that phi of y is bigger or equal to x. Uh, and this should have been a Roman two with me. Okay, so then we have case three and case four that I'll leave as an exercise. So case three is when x is not an O and y is an O. And case four is when none of them, neither of them are an O. Uh, so, so I'll leave this as an exercise. That's an easy exercise. Okay, we pretty much do the same thing. So if y is an, if, if for, for example, here, if x is not an O, then it's the supremum over all t's that's smaller than x, but because x is smaller than y, this t is also smaller than y. And now because t and y are both in O, we can use case one to get what we want. And case four is similar. Okay, so I'll leave this as an exercise. And so the conclusion is that we are done proving that phi is increasing. Now, here's an easy step two. We prove that phi of one is one. We prove that phi of one is one. Uh, this is because uh, OK, let me remind you, consists of two to the k minus one intervals. So for x in the two to the k minus first or minus one, whatever, interval, we have phi of x is equal to two to the k minus one divided by two to the k. Uh, that's, that's the definition of phi of x. And now phi of one is the supremum over phi of t such that t is less than one and t is an O. And in particular, this supremum is bigger than for this x. So anything in O is actually less than one. So it's bigger than two to the k minus one divided by two to the k for every k. And because true for every k, we can now send k to infinity and derive that phi of one is bigger or equal to one. But it's also smaller than one. So uh, uh, phi cannot jump above one. So also, uh, missing the letters. So also on O, phi is always actually strictly smaller than one. So the supremum is less or equal to one, and so it's equal to one. So five one is one, five zero is zero, 
this was just our definition and 5 1 is 1. So my point is uh, that if we prove that phi is continuous, we will get onto for free. Okay, so that's that's a consequence of some simple theorem from advanced analysis that a continuous function takes all the values. So if if you have a continuous function that's zero and zero and one at one, then it will take all values between zero and one. Uh, that's because a continuous well, that's basically what continuous function is. Uh, so we only need continuity now. So step three, phi is continuous. And it will be very important here that phi is increasing because we need to ask ourselves uh, that we need to ask ourselves this. If, if phi wants to be discontinuous, what options does it have? And in fact, it has only one option. It can only have a jump. So assume not. Assume not. Then phi has a jump. So there are three types of discontinuities. A jump that looks something like this. Uh, the second order discontinuity that looks somehow like this, for example, when the function is unbounded. And the removable discontinuity, which looks, uh, I'm drawing constant for some reason, which looks like this. But out of these three, only one has a chance to be increasing. It's this first one. Okay, so a removable discontinuity like this cannot happen for an increasing function. And this cannot happen for phi because it's bounded, uh, but also increasing. So this, uh, let's see. Yeah, well, I theoretically could draw an increasing unbounded function, but because phi is bounded, this cannot happen. So I need to cross this out, I need to cross this out. So the only option is a jump. So that's very important to understand that to prove that phi is continuous, I only need to prove that phi doesn't have a jump. Uh, so let's do it. So uh, moreover, uh, this jump should occur at x in C. So on OK, on, on O, which is the union of all case, uh, phi cannot be discontinuous. Because uh, if we're in OK, it means that we are in one of the open intervals. And on the open interval, we are constant, in particular continuous. So the only option for a discontinuity is on C, where we have this, uh, this uh, weird definition of phi. So supremum should not necessarily preserve continuity, but here it will. So I only want to prove that phi doesn't have a jump. Okay, so let's let's do it. Uh, so let's take so take now x is in C, and I'll assume x is not zero. So for x equal to zero, I'll leave it as an exercise, but it's actually absolutely the same. For x equal to zero, it will be absolutely the same, uh, just slightly easier. Uh, okay, so if x is in C, it means that uh, x is not in OK for any k. And this implies that for 
any I'll write large in the parentheses because large is what we need. Okay. Uh, we can find intervals i, m, k, and i, m plus one k such that x lies in between. So my x is in C and I can always find an interval on an open interval on the left of x and an open interval on the right of x. Maybe they have different lengths. Just a second. And this will be ikm and this will be ikm plus one. Yep, go ahead. Um, is there a reason the notation for the i's got flipped? Uh, no. Yeah, good question. No, there is absolutely no reason. Uh, let's change it. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so K, K used to be on the top. Yeah, thank you. K M plus one. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it actually makes more sense also. So that's better. Yeah, thank you. Good catch. Uh, all right, and so uh, so now, yeah, so now these intervals, so as k grows, as k grows, these intervals get closer and closer to x. Okay, because like on the kth step, we erase these two intervals, but on the k plus first step, we'll also erase something in the middle here and something in the middle here, and it will get closer to x. And then we'll go ahead and erase more and more intervals like in the middle of our gaps. And they will, they, they will become smaller by themselves, but they will also approach x. Okay, so take, let's say, AK in I, MK, and BK in I, M plus one K. Okay, then we have Phi of X minus Phi of AK. Okay, we already know that Phi is increasing everywhere. So that's less or equal than Phi of BK minus phi of a k and we know that phi of b k is m plus one divided by two to the k and phi of a k is m divided by two to the k so m cancels out and this will be one over two to the k and this implies that the limit the following limit as a approaches x from the left I'll write x minus zero and a is an O of phi of x minus phi, sorry, f of x, my, yeah, phi, 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 phi of x minus phi of a k is zero. So this limit is zero. Okay. Because we see that phi of x minus phi of a k uh, becomes small is smaller than one over two to the k and if k goes to infinity uh, we get zero so similarly the limit as b approaches x from the right and b is an o phi of b uh, phi of b minus phi of x is also zero absolutely for the same reason because if i write phi of b Phi of bk minus phi of x, it's less or equal than phi of bk minus phi of ak. Okay, and if you look at uh, this blue rectangle and at this blue rectangle, if you look at them for a couple of minutes, you'll see that 
uh, I don't need a K here, by the way. You will see that phi cannot have a jump at x if something like this happens. Because if phi has a jump, uh, so a jump looks either like this for increasing function or it looks like this. And in any case, one of the limits is not zero. If it looked like, if it looked like this, then the limit as b approaches x from the right is strictly positive. If it looks like this, then the first limit will be strictly positive. Uh, so this proves that phi can't have a jump. And so it continues. So that's a very nasty proof. This is the proof that I hate one of the most in this course because it's basically bookkeeping. Uh, but nevertheless, so it, it, it will have consequences that I like in this course. So unfortunately, it's important to have this proof. Okay, so now finally, step four, I already kind of explained it that phi prime of x is zero on O. So why is it true? Because if x is an O, it means that x is an OK. And this means that x is in some I uh, M K or I K M. And this implies that phi is a constant uh, around x. And this implies that phi prime of x is zero. So in particular, phi is phi, phi prime is zero almost everywhere. So in particular, phi prime of x is zero almost everywhere because we figured out last time that. So measure of O is measure of, uh, well, I don't even need this because measure of the counter set is zero and counter set is the error set here. Okay, so phi prime is zero almost everywhere and we know that phi of one minus phi of zero is equal to one, but the integral from zero to one of The integral from zero, the Lebesgue integral phi prime of x, I don't even need x, phi prime dm1 is zero. So this in particular implies that phi is not absolutely continuous. Because for an absolutely continuous function, integral is equal to uh, phi of one minus phi of zero. So phi is not absolutely continuous. Okay, and I have five more minutes. So any questions about this before I state the next result? Nope, everything is good. So I, yeah, I don't see your sad faces. So if you, if, if, if something's wrong, you should ask. Okay, so here's the theorem. So we'll now introduce a function psi, which will be the same as counter plus x. Uh, so then uh, phi uh, psi, sorry, is continuous, which is obvious, continuous. Now it's strictly increasing, which is also obvious because phi is increasing and x is strictly increasing. So uh, 
if we add strictly increasing to increasing, we get strictly increasing. Okay, it maps zero one onto zero two, which is also uh, kind of obvious because uh, psi of zero is zero plus zero and psi of one is one plus one, and it's continuous, so it's onto. Uh, so this is not super important. What is important is that psi, that if we take the image of O and measure it, and if we take the image of the counter set and measure it, they'll be equal, they'll be equal to one. So psi, psi is actually a very ugly function. It takes a set of measure zero, which is C. It takes a very small set and transforms it to a very fat set. So it takes a set of measure zero and transforms it to a set of measure one, which is half the measure of the image of phi. Okay, so I'm going to prove it. Okay, so again, this first sentence continues, strictly increasing, onto that's all obvious. We only need to prove that psi of C has measure one, or psi of O has measure one. Okay, so recall that O is equal to the union of O case, and O K is equal to I uh, K one union, union I K two to the K minus one. Okay, so I want to measure psi of OK. So I know that, o, that OKs are like this. And I know that these intervals, I's, are enumerated in the right order. Now psi is strictly increasing. So psi is continuous, strictly increasing. And this implies a very important thing, which I want you all to picture. I, I don't want to draw the picture, but I want you all to picture it in your mind. That psi of this yep, IMK is also an open interval and uh, okay l right and for a fixed k this family is disjoint Okay, because, so okay, I have one eye and I have another eye and this eye is on the right from this eye. So because psi is increasing and continuous, this property of being on the right uh, is preserved. So if two intervals were uh, disjoint, then because psi is increasing and continuous, the images will still be disjoint. Okay, and so it implies that the measure of psi of OK is sum of measures of psi of IMK. Okay, now M becomes a horrible letter. So we really need to distinguish M from the Lebed measure M1. And now how does, what does, phi due to this interval. So psi, sorry, so psi is x plus phi. Psi is x plus phi. Phi doesn't do anything to the interval. Phi, phi is a constant on the interval. So on ikm, phi is a constant. And x basically just shifts it. So my point is that 
measure of psi of an interval is the same as the measure of the interval. So this is the crucial equality. That, that psi preserves uh, the measures of the intervals. Okay, and because i's are disjoint, this is just m1 of OK. Uh, okay, so I'll finish on Friday. I'm almost done. So because I computed the measure of psi of OK, I can now pass, go, uh, pass to the limit and get that measure of psi of O is the same as measure of O and measure of O is 1. Uh, but we'll finish on Friday. So any quick questions about this computation? And we'll, yeah. you will also show that the measure of psi of C is also one on Friday. Yes, I will, but it, it, it will follow from this immediately because psi of C is disjoint from psi of O because C is disjoint from O. Uh, and so if measure of psi of O is one and they are in zero two, so if this takes measure one, then this also takes measure one. Uh, so yes, I will explain this maybe in a little bit more details, but the crucial thing is that measure of psi of O is one. But yeah, this second thing is also not done yet. You're right. <clears throat> okay, then see you on Friday. And yeah, I, I, I'll, so, uh, one quick thing about the homeworks. I'll probably send two homeworks uh, at once right now. So one will be due next Friday and one will be due next next Friday. And the only reason to send you both is that if you find one of them easier, if you find that the first one is easier, you can start doing the second one earlier. So the second one will be purely on counter sets. Uh, well, almost. And the first one will be on absolutely continuous functions but they will be due on different days. All right. Um, so, uh -huh. would, will you have any chance on uh, Friday to meet for questions? Sure, yeah. So I, yeah, I can stay a little bit after, uh, what's that, after 11, I guess. Okay. So first of all, I have a 15 minutes window after class. So if you're willing to stay for 15 minutes until 10.10, we can do this, but then I can come back after 11. Okay. Uh, so I still yeah, have this. I have, yeah, I have to do another Zoom meeting right now, but um, I can do it to 15 minutes after on Friday. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Great. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see you all on Friday. Uh, can they always be here?